So the topic we're going to talk about today is the month of uh, Kislev, which this Thursday is going to be Rosh Chodesh, and past Shabbat was Shabbat Mevachim. We bless the month of Kislev, and every month of the year has a certain hamshacha, a certain blessing that comes from above. Every month has a certain power, a certain koach. And we want to know how it manifests from the spiritual world and affects us. Besides celebrating holidays and following the calendar, we want to know how the months of the year actually affect us and what we can derive out of that and what do I need to work on in this specific month. And not only this month, in any month in general, but today we'll talk about the month of Kislev, which we know that in this month, there's one of the most best holidays in the year, the holiday of Hanukkah. And we know that very soon when Mashiach is going to come, all the holidays will be cancelled. And the only holidays that will remain will be Hanukkah and Purim. All the rest of the holidays are written in the Torah and they are ordered in the Torah. Once Mashiach is going to come, that's it, these holidays will be cancelled. We're not going to celebrate them anymore. And of course, it's going to come in a certain time. It's not the second that Mashiach comes, because the coming of Mashiach is going to be broken down into periods. But Chazal say, our sages say, that at some point, even the mitzvahs, we're going to stop doing mitzvot. And the Rebbe explains why, what's the reason that the holidays will be canceled, is because each holiday brings a certain hamshacha into the world. And if I tune myself, according to the Torah, Torah teaches me, to that holiday, then I'm able to take this he'ara, this shine, this godly light, and then it stays with me. So if in, in uh, Pesach, it tells me to eat matzot, and to do lel seder, and to keep all the laws of, of Pesach, then it means that by me doing that, it's not a prehistoric ritual, rather it's a way for me to tap into this godly revelation that is compared to a light that is shining, and I'm basing, basically making myself a vessel to hold this he'ara, this godly light, and by that, now I'm containing this light, and that's it, now I have it in my possession. The problem in the time of Galut, of exile, is that the days pass, so we have one day of Yom Tov, or two days, and that's it, then this light disappears. At the time of the Geulah, it's not going to disappear anymore, we're going to have it and contain it. So, therefore, we don't need to have it again. Now, the word holiday in Hebrew is called Chag. If you notice here by living in Israel that on the Yom Tov they wish you Chag Sameach. Now, Chag, the direct translation of the word Chag is holiday. But the word Chag comes from the word Lachug. Lachug means to go into a, in a circle. The sticks, I don't know how you call them in English. How do you call them in the, in the clock? The hands? You call it a hand? Yeah. In Hebrew it's called mechogim. Why? Because it's chag. It's going in a circle and it's constantly re returning to the point where it started from. So the holidays in Hebrew, the word holiday in Hebrew, chag, means because the, the year turns around, all the days pass, and then it returns to the same day. That's why it's called a chag. At the time of the Geulah, of the redemption, once we're going to be containing this godly revelation, then it's not going to need to be repeated again. Therefore, these holidays are going to be cancelled. The only holidays that will not be cancelled is Hanukkah and Purim. Because the godly light that comes down in these two holidays is above the descending chain. It's above Seder Ishtal Shelut. Therefore, these holidays will never be cancelled. Rather, we will see that they these will become the most prominent and dominating days of the year. For example, you see the day of, Pur, of, of Yom Kippur. If you read the word in Hebrew, it's, it's called Yom Kippurim. But if you break the Kaf and the Purim, it's Ke Purim, like Purim. Which means that in the, in the level of the godly revelation, Purim is a much higher day than Yom Kippur. The Yom Kippur, just the day itself, Yud in Tishrei, was decided by the Kadosh Baruch that this will be the day that if you just sit like this quiet for 24 hours and you don't move, you kept the day of Yom Kippur. You can sleep for 24 hours. You don't necessarily have to pray and do anything. Just sleep for 24 hours, you kept Yom Kippur. 
and just by the holiness of the day that was decided by God, then our sins can be completely wipe, wiped off. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu went the second time to the, to the mountain, he went up to Shemaim after the golden calf, the sin of the golden calf. Hashem didn't want to forgive the Jews. And at some point, Moshe Rabbeinu was able to figure out the code to, to activate the 13 attributes of mercy by actually saying them, Hashem, Hashem, Kel Rachum V'chanun, Erech Apayim, V'Rav Chesed, V'Emet, Notzer Chesed La'alavim, Hashem. Moshe said, Moshe Rabbeinu said these words, like what we say when we say Tachanun, and that's it, then Hashem was, was ready to forgive, and it says, Shalachti I will forgive them as you requested. Meaning that these 13 words are basically a code to crack open the motion of mercy of the Kadosh Bucho, which is called Avarachamim. Avarachamim, amazingly, you will see that if you take the word Kislev, Kaf, Samech, Lamed, and Vav, if you write it, what's called Bemilui, which means that Kaf is Kaf and Pesovit, and then Lamed is Lamed Mem Daled, I don't know if you learned that, but this is called Gimatria Melea, then the gematria of the full name of Kislev is Avarachamim. Gematria Melea is basically Aleph is one, Bet is two. You following? So there's something that is called Gematria Melea. Aleph can be written Aleph Lamed Pei. The word Aleph, and then Lamed will be Lamed Mem Daled. So if you take the word Kislev, not Kaf Samech Lamed Vav, rather Kaf is Kaf Pesovit. Samech is, is Samech Mem Chaf, right? So if you take the Gimatria Melea of Kislev, is the same numerical value, Gimatria of Avarachamim, which we have the exact same power of activating this mercy, this Chachamim from the Kadosh Baruch But the day of Yom Kippur, that was the day that was decided by the Kadosh Baruch that will be the day of atonement. That just by the holiness of the day, Kdushat Hayom, one can just sit like this and 50% of his sins get wiped off. The reason why I'm saying 50% because Yom Kippur will only erase sins between me and the Kadosh Baruch Hu, Adam Lamakom, that are not falling under the category of Karet and, and Mitah Bidei Shamaim, which is death by the heavenly court. If a person has to shalom desecrated Shabbat, or ate Chametz on Pesach, or, or drove or ate something on Yom Kippur, all the 36 sins of Karet, Yom Kippur does not atone for that. The Yom Kippur actually puts the sin on hold, and then a person has to do tshuva and go through what's called Yisurim, hardship, and then that's what will atone, what's, will atone for the sin. And the sins between a person to another person, Adam lechavero, if I did not appease a person that I hurt, then Yom Kippur will not help me. I have to go and apologize to the person, return what I took, and, and make you know, peace. That's why we have 40 days in Elul to straighten everything out. But the day itself is so holy, they just by observing the holiday of Yom Kippur, then I'm going into the heavenly dishwasher and everything is cleaned. And the holiday of Purim is even a much higher Gilu'i Lekut, a much higher godly revelation on the day of Purim that Yom Kippur is called Ke Purim, like Purim. So the holidays of Hanukkah and Purim are going to remain at the time of the redemption only because the godly revelation that shines on those days is above the descending chain. Now, how is that reflecting to us and how is that affecting us? So I understand that these are very two special holidays. But the miracle of Hanukkah happened Dafka on, on, on the month of Kislev. It didn't happen by chance. Nothing happens by chance. If a certain event happened in history, it's because there's a certain Ashgachah Pratid here. And it happened only because of the power of what's called Mesirut Nefesh. Mesirut Nefesh is the self-sacrifice that the Maccabim did, that they went to fight a whole army. And with the power of Mesirut Nefesh, anything that you do in Mesirut Nefesh, the power that you bring with it permeates what you do for generations. So we, of course, don't have to fight in, in, against an army, but our entire Avodah Hashem is, has to be in Sirut Nefesh. Sirut Nefesh is to, it's called self-sacrifice. And one example out of many, we follow the Torah, we pray, we eat kosher, we keep Shabbat, we do everything because we understand that it's the right thing to do. Some people do it because they're afraid of the consequences. Some people do it out of unbelievable love to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Each one has their own agenda why they follow the mitzvot. But here comes always the Yetzer Ra, and he starts to get you off certain things. So for example, when you do a mitzvah in Tzirut Nefesh, and I gave an example not too long ago because we have the, the minhag, the custom that we put a bucket of water next to our bed, 
I mean the bucket and the cup of the Nagel Buster next to the bed. And when we wake up in the morning, right before, before we even put our feet on the ground, we wash our hands. And there's many mystical explanations to that. At night we have uh, uh, our neshama leaves the body, our ruach leaves the body. What stays in the body is a very small piece of the nefesh, which is the lowest part of the neshama. The Gemara gives an example that if you take a barrel, and a barrel full of sand. Now turn the barrel upside down, so all the sand goes out, and then the barrel is completely empty and clean. But if you take a barrel full of honey, and you turn the barrel upside down, then all the honey will slowly, slowly drip out, but when you turn the barrel back, it still has a lot of honey on the walls. And then all the cockroaches and all the flies are all gonna come to, to suck on this honey. So a soul that is in a body, of a person that does not follow the Torah and Mitzvah, the soul is not soaked with Kedusha. When the soul leaves the body, it's like an empty barrel. Nothing wants to come next to this body. But a person did one mitzvah, one mitzvah in, in the day, he just helped another person. Then the soul is soaked with holiness, it's radiating holiness. Now the soul leaves the body at night, because at night when we go to sleep, our soul goes up to the heavenly court. First of all, it goes to give an account, what I did, writes a diary. I woke up in the morning, I did like this and like that, I did this and that. That after 120 years when we go back to the heavenly court, they tell us, here's your diary, you wrote everything. More than that, the soul gets charged. Like at the end of the day, your cell phone uh, runs out of battery, you plug it into the wall, so in the morning you have a full battery. So the soul gets charged. That's why you see that some people, they can go to sleep for two hours, and they wake up in the morning, they're like, like strong like a mountain. And some people can sleep for 12 hours and they wake up in the morning and they're all tired. Because the soul did not go to the right place and did not get it charged. That's why it's extremely important that we focus on doing Kriyat Shema Lamita. And women are also obligated in Kriyat Shema Lamita. It's not a, 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 a decision whether you want to do it or not. Also women are obligated to read the, the bedtime Shema. And if you would know and understand the, the meaning behind it, you would not probably miss it even once. Because what it does to the neshama, in the physical level, first of all, it protects the body. Because at night, the analogy of the, of the barrel, when the soul is full of dusha and it leaves the body, then the body is like the barrel of honey. It's, the body is full of holiness, full of dusha. And all these chitzonim, these external negative forces will come to bite a little bit off this dusha. And then when the neshama comes in the morning and wants to penetrate back into the body, then the body has all these spiritual entities in it. And that's one of the main reasons why it causes people for, uh, anxieties and fears and all these problems because they basically have something very impure in their body that they, they allowed it to come in. That's why Kriyat Shmalamita is extremely, extremely important because if you remember the Nosach, the, what you're saying, one of the prayers what we're saying, we're reading a pasuk from Tehilim, sorry, from Shir HaShirim, and it says, Hineh mitato shel ishlomo, shishim giborim saviv, lo migiborei Yisrael. Basically, you placing 60 angels around your nefesh, your ruch, and your neshama. We repeat it three times. And there are many verses that we say, and what you're doing, you're basically putting an army of, of angels around your body. And more than that, the Rizal explains, it's brought down in Tanya many times, that the actual saying of Kriyat Shmar Lamita is a tikkun. It's mamash correcting the blemishes that are on our soul for what we, we did when we were young, when we, before we had the, the ability to even follow the Torah and the mitzvot. And the tikkun is so powerful that if the person does it the right way at night, then the Shema goes completely clean up to Shemaim, goes, give an account, and then you don't even need Yom Kippur. Because you did your tshuva already at the end of the day, and there's no better time to do tshuva but at the end of the day. Because on Yom Kippur, how can you do tshuva for a year back? I don't remember what I did two weeks ago. How can I do tshuva on Yom Kippur 11th month back? So we have auspicious times in, in, the, in the year to do tshuva. The main one is Yom Kippur, of course. Then Rosh Chodesh, Erev Rosh Chodesh, the eve of Rosh Chodesh, is called Yom Kippur Katan. That some congregations, they, really, they have the minhag and they fast on Erev, Yom Kippur, on Erev Rosh Chodesh. And then of course Erev Shabbat, Friday afternoon before you light candles is a very auspicious time to do tshuva. A lot of people they light candles with pressure and you know the last minute. The right way to do it is you make sure that you're prepared, you after your shower, you dress right in your Shabbos clothes, you take your time, you dive in Mincha. 
you, you, you think about your entire week and you do, before you strike the match, you do tshuva. What did I do this week? Maybe I wasn't so okay with my friends this week. Maybe I owe somebody money. Maybe I hurt somebody's feelings. Maybe I can, maybe I can uh, correct everything. And the, the last auspicious time to do tshuva is Kirat Shema Lamita. I finished my day. Okay, let me see. Let me make an account. How was the day? Did I get up in the morning? Did I really do what I'm supposed to do this day? Did I complete my shlichut this, this day? And a person, if he does tshuva at the end of the day, then you know, he's nothing to worry about. All his life he's in tshuva. And he knows how to correct things. <coughs> the problem is that we're human and we forget things. I always give the same example that one time I came home, it was very late, and my wife told me I borrowed $40 from our neighbor because I didn't have cash to pay the cleaning lady. She just know that we owe her $40. So I told her, okay, here's $40, go and pay her. And she said, oh, it's 10 o'clock at night, why should I pay now? I'll do it in the morning. And I told her, no, pay it now. You know why? Because you're going to wake up in the morning, and you have six kids to get ready to school, and you're going to forget. You're human. And then you're going to forget, the afternoon will come, and the next day, and the next day, and before you know it, three, four days will pass, she will start seeing you in the hall, and she'll be like, she didn't give me back my money. And it's not about the $40, it's the fact that you did, took and you didn't give back. Now you're going to forget, you're busy, you have a life. And days will pass, she's going to start getting upset, she's going to start talking Lashon Ara about you to the other neighbors, you know, I gave her $40 and she never gave it back, and before you know it, you're going to completely forget about it, because it's only $40, and before you know it, she's upset with you. And she's having these feelings of anger towards you. And then she doesn't want to talk to you. And then you don't know what's going on. And you think you're going to remember on Yom Kippur. Oh, yeah, I remember I borrowed $40 11 months ago. And now you made her upset. And God even knows what she's going to go and say. So why delay it? Here's now the money. Give it back. Do the fix things on the spot. Don't, don't delay it. So we have very auspicious times at the, on the, in, in, in the year to do tshuva, and one of them is Kriyat Shema Lamita. So the entire concept of Kriyat Shema Lamita, it's extremely important to learn it and to know what it means and what it really does, because it's not some, you know, a couple verses that you say before you go to sleep and you're, you know, in your pajamas holding your teddy bear. It's mamash a prayer. You want to say it when you're dressed and when your mind is focused and not when you, you know, have falling asleep. So at the time of Kriyat Shema Lamita, you're really, really cleaning your neshama. And when a person does it the right way, then the neshama goes up to Shemaim and it gets charged at night. And then you wake up in the morning energized, full of energy. And I know many people, they go to sleep, they'll sleep for 10 hours and they wake up in the morning. They're, they're like a shmate. Why? Because at night the neshama didn't go to the right place to draw down these new kohot, this new energy. So when a person goes to sleep at night, then he wakes up in the morning, then he's completely energized. So I don't know how we drifted from our topic to Kriyat Shema Lamita, but the point is that we're constantly getting this hamshacha from above. And every month has a certain hamshacha. Oh, you know, I remember how, why I told you about Kriyat Shema Lamita. Because I said the msirut nefesh on the mitzvah of washing the hands next to the bed. So what happens is the neshama leaves the body at night, and then there's a lot of powers of impurity, different klipot that come to the body because they want to like suck out this kedusha. And then in the morning when the neshama comes back into the body, the neshama only penetrates still the hands until the feet. That's why when we were constantly washing our hands because only the nefesh gets dressed in the, in the palms and in the feet. The actual neshama goes on uh, up until the wrist. So when the neshama goes into the body in the morning, there's a lot of uh, what's called a ruach tumah, like a spirit of impurity on the hand. And the first thing that you wake up in the morning, you want to say moderni. And the next thing you want to do is before you even put the feet on the ground, you want to wash your, your hands with water, with clean water. Now since the water was standing the entire night, it's always good, good always to also cover it. Because when it's not covered, the water accepts tumah, impurity. So you're going to cover it maybe with a plate or something. And, and it's good enough water to wash your hands to go a couple steps to, to wash it with clean water. But the Arizal is very particular not to put, even put your feet on the ground. Because once you wake up in the morning and you consider what's called Briyach Hadasha, a new creation, the first thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to connect yourself to the ground. Which the ground has a very uh, 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 strong energy that pulls energy down. 
This is what's called in the terminology of Kabbalah, HaRatzon Lekabel, the, the will of taking. And this is the, the, the power that comes from the sphere of Malchut. Because the world was created with the sphere of Malchut, and Malchut has the, the, the motion of just observing. And I don't want now, with my brand new energy, to put my feet on the ground, and then the, 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 the ground to pull all my energy down. And there's are many more explanations to that, but the fact is that we, we do it b'msirut nefesh, that we, we wash our hands first thing in the morning. And when you come to think of it, it's not really a mitzvah, it's not even, it's, it's just some, we added this thing to go beyond the letter of the law. So for example, we have a very particular thing in our home that all my kids, they have the negel wasa next to their bed. My three-year-old, they all have it. And they prepare it at night, and they all carry it, and it's a part of the ritual before going to sleep. And other people say, okay, it's a three-year-old, it's a five-year-old, they don't really, didn't really need to do it. And I say, no, if I get it into their system now, when they're kids, and I really fight for that, the effect will be that this will permeate with them for generations. They'll remember that for the rest of their life, they will do that to their kids, and the power of Mesirut Nefesh, of going out of my way for something so small that it's not even a mitzvah, it's not even an obligation. It's an extra of an extra of an extra. Of course it brings a lot of purity, but the fact that I'm fighting, this is called Mesirut Nefesh, self-sacrifice, I'm going completely out of my way to do something, that permeates a power that is way beyond Sadr Shalshalot, above the descending chain. That's why anything that we do that comes in this Mesirut Nefesh, then the power that I bring down, that I draw down, what's called Hamshacha, is constantly sh Hashem is shining His light on us. And I want to be a vessel to pull down this light. And if I prepare myself the right way, I'm going to be a vessel that actually contains this light. These are the mitzvot. That's why I do a lot of mitzvot. Why? Because I'm preparing these vessels to contain this godly light. So, the, one of the many reasons why they won the war in Hanukkah, because because of this Mesirut Nefesh. But on the month of Kislev, Kislev has a very special power to it. That Kislev, the entire He'ara, the shining in the month is above the descending chain, which is a month that one can achieve unbelievable goals. The only problem is that we see, if we analyze the, the, the year, and especially what's going on in Kislev, that we saw that the miracle of Hanukkah occurred in Kislev. And what was the actual war? The war was against the Greek. Besides the actual war that happened, the, the, the physical and spiritual war was against the, the, the kingdom of, of the Greek. Now we know that there are four types of galuyot, of exile. The first one was Mitzrayim, then Babel, then Romi, then Yavan. Now, one of the hints that we know about these four exiles, in the first verse, actually the second, excuse me, the second verse of the Torah, when it's talking about Bereshit bara lokim tashamayim v'ta'aretz, first Hashem created the heaven and the earth. And then it says, v'aretz ayta choshech al pnei tom, and it goes, when it's talking about, in this verse, it's mentioning the four exiles. And the exile, choshech, that's the exile of what's called of Galut Yavan, the exile of the kingdom of, of Yavan, of Greece. It's not Greece, the country, it's rather Yavan. And this is the exile that we are in now. It's the last exile, and it's the hardest one because it's compared to choshech, to darkness. And that's when the verse says, "Va'aretz ayta tov avo," and the land was a complete mess. The choshech al pnei tov, that there was complete darkness. And this is the exile that we are in right now. This exile of choshech, of darkness. And what was the 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 fight of the Greek? La shkicham toratecha. They didn't come to kill us. They didn't come to extinct us or to put us as slaves, like, me, like Egypt. They wanted to make the Torah that we, we're going to forget the Torah. That's what we're going to read in four weeks in Hanukkah. When we're adding all the extra prayers, we constantly will say, They wanted us to forget the Torah. They did not like the concept of the Torah, because the Torah completely contradicted their way of life. Now the Zohar comes and explains that and, you know, I'll do it in a very short way of explanation. I'm sure you, maybe, I don't know how, how, uh, how well it's explained here, but Zohar explains that there are three types of domains in the world. 
And the first domain is what's called Tzitra de Kedusha, the, 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 the Tzad, the side of Kedusha. And then you have the Tzitra, Tzitra of Tuma, the side of impurity. And then you have what's called Klipat Noga. And Klipat Noga is a mediate between both. Which if a person points himself to the side of Kedusha of holiness, then his entire Hamshacha, his energy comes from holiness. Now Baal Shem Tov explains that in Shamaim there are two chambers. Chamber of purity and chamber of impurity. If I m focus myself to the chamber of purity, then like, a, like an IV, I draw down to myself only pure energy. What's called a, in the Hasidic terminology a hamshacha, so that I pull down some positive energy. But if I monitor myself, if I focus myself to the chamber of impurity, which by its, the, the, the way I'm, I channel myself to the chamber of impurity or purity, if it's the impurity, it's by me doing everything that is against what Hashem wants me to do. Which is basically all the sins that the Torah tells me don't do. All the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. So I focus myself on this chamber because even, even the, the side of impurity, I can still get some type of a he'ara, some type of an enlightening. Because the klipa is also has a, a power to lechayot, to enliven something. It's just that I'm pulling it from klipa. So I can pull the chayut, the life force, either from Kedusha or either from Klippa. Depends on me. If I focus myself on Kedusha, by following what the Torah tells me, the Torah is not uh, rules to annoy me. A lot of people look at the Torah and they're like, it's a bunch of rituals and all sorts of restrictions to make my life hard. The Torah says, no, I'm not here to restrict you. I'm here to guide you and to educate you how you focus to the Tzad of Kedusha, to the chamber of beauty. And if you do that, then the IV that comes from Shamaim, I call it an IV. Like a person sitting in a hospital and has an IV bag and all the vitamins and the minerals just go into his vein. So the Torah tells you, I'm going to teach you how you focus yourself to the spiritual part of holiness. And if you do that, the entire Hamshacha, all this energy that Hashem wants to just bestow on you, is only going to come through this unbelievable filter of this chamber of holiness. But if Chas Shalom, you're going to go against what the Torah says, if the Torah tells you, do not eat this animal, it's not to make your diet annoying. It's to tell you, no, the channel that you connect yourself by eating this specific animal, the Hamshacha, the energy you're pulling down, is coming through the Tzad of Tumah. That's it. That's why the word Tumah comes in Hebrew from the word Atum. Atum is sealed. Why? Because anything that I bring from Tumah, it conceals and it covers Kedusha, holiness. That's why it's called Tum'ah. I mean, the words in Hebrew, they have meaning. It's not that they just invented them. So the Torah tell, tells me, do not eat this animal, or don't do this action, or don't light fire on Shabbat. And if you do that, what's going to happen is you basically channel yourself to achieve more of impurity. The Hamshacha you're going to get, the energy you're going to get, the life force you're going to contain now, it's coming from the other side of holiness. And as a result, any light that you will get will right away disappear. Meaning that my, I have a vessel, I have now a cup, and anything that will be put in it, right away will disappear. This is what's called the, the, the pleasures of this world. That's why anything that has to do with pleasure, the pleasure in this world disappears fast. You go to a good meal, it ends after an hour and it gets digested and that's it. You go see a movie, if you see movies, and then you enjoy yourself for an hour or two, and that's it, the pleasure disappeared. You go to a vacation, one week, you enjoyed yourself in a beautiful resort, it disappeared. It doesn't come back. This is like a, a very momentary pleasure. So all these pleasures, they're coming, why? Because I'm pulling it from a side of impurity. Anything that comes from the side of purity, if I do now a mitzvah, this mitzvah will remain with me for eternity. Now I don't feel the pleasure necessarily. I can put now tefillin on. I'm not going to feel the pleasure spiritual pleasure from the mitzvah, but in the world to come, I'm going to have this unbelievable pleasure from the mitzvah that I did for eternity. And it will remain with me and it will never disappear. Why? Because it was brought from the chamber of purity. So the Torah just comes and tells me, listen, I'm just coming to you as a guide. You know, Torah comes from the word hora'ah, to teach. Torah says, Here, here's a guide, follow these rules, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that, you'll be good, everything will be fine. So I can have the option of pulling my entire life force from Kedusha, from holiness, by following what the Torah tells me, and I have also the option of pulling this life force from the inside of impurity. 
But then in between, I have one domain that it's not here and not there. This is what's called Klipat Noga. Because the sign of impurity is broken into three categories, and these are the three, shalosh klipot me'ot, the three channels of impurity, that the impurity is so severe and so strong that the concealment that it does is so powerful that I cannot even see the difference between the truth and not the truth. That's why I said before, why is it called shalosh klipot tmeot? Tame is impure, comes from the word atum. So it's three layers that they conceal the light of Kedusha. Like you take now this, uh, you take a window, I can have a drape, and then a curtain, and then uh, shutters. So I have three layers how I can filter the light in. So if I close the shutters, and then the drapes, and then the blinds, I completely, completely shut down the option of the light to come into this room. Now I did not affect the sun by me closing the window. The sun is shining exactly the same. Just by me closing the shutters, closing the blinds, and closing the, the, the curtain, three layers that filter the light, that's it. Now I'm basically segregating myself from uh, enjoying the light that's shining outside. So when you think of it, did, that, did I affect the sun? No, I didn't affect the sun, no. It will shine in all the rest of the rooms exactly the same. Am I punishing the sun? Am I doing something to the sun? No, the sun is shining equally. What I did basically is I now restricted by three filters the light to come into this room. These are these shalosh klipot mode, these three screens of impurity. Because the, again, the word tum'ah comes from the word atum. Atum is sealed, something that is completely sealed. That's it. So now I'm sitting in my body. My neshama is in my body. I created these three layers. And it's, up, it's only up to me to remove these layers. It's not up to anyone else. Nobody can remove them for me. I have to, I'm, I'm the one who has to go now and do a certain act, which is called tshuva, and I start removing this. I'm starting to opening these shutters, and then back again, the light of holiness has to come in. So this is shalosh klipot mod. This is completely impure, and I don't want to do anything to do with it. Because when a person is completely stuck in this klipa, then his reality, his entire reality, he, she, same thing, the entire reality, is not seeing the, the truth. Because the klipa is the ultimate power of deception, of shekel. That's why the Zohar calls this world Alma de Shikra, the world of lying. And the world above is the world of truth. Why? Because a person can be stuck in this klipa and his perception about the world is completely distorted. And he thinks everything's fine. And a person will go and think or do and act according to certain things and they think it's totally fine. Why? Because their entire existence is covered by this tum'ah, by this impurity. But then we're stuck in between. We have the Klipat Noga. What is exactly Klipat Noga? Is the Torah tells me, look, there are a lot of things that you are permitted to do. You're allowed to eat. You're allowed to have fun. You're allowed to have marital relations. You're allowed to have all sorts of things. Just that the Torah didn't tell me how much I can do that. So I can eat now a whole three pounds of ice cream right now. Am I doing something against the Torah? No, it doesn't say in the Torah I'm not allowed to eat. Yeah, but if I'm eating three pounds of ice cream with no purpose, so I'm just doing it for my own sake. I'm going, doing it from my own desire, my ta'ava, my lust to the ice cream. I can be the same thing with a little cup of ice cream and it'll be just good. This is what's called lekadesh et atzmecha b'mutar lecha. Sanctifying yourself with what you are permitted. So the Torah tells me you can eat. Just don't eat steaks all day long and sushis and gourmet meals. That you eat on Shabbat. On Shabbat it's a mitzvah to eat. During the week just eat a sandwich. Eat something simple. You don't have to go overboard. Now the problem with, with Klipat Nonga, the Klipat Nonga is not here and not here. It's in between. When the Zohar is talking about the four exiles, it's saying that the exile of Yavan is the exile that com that's corresponding to Klipat Nonga. Because what was the theory, what was the, 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 the idea of the Greek? is that just enjoy, what did they bring to the world? Sports, theater, all these things. They, they brought it, the Olympics, they, they brought it down. All this uh, culture and art, because they said, listen, we believe in godly wisdoms. They were very, very smart. But don't connect to us things that are beyond our sechel. They wanted to understand everything. That was their thing. We will do what we understand. And what we don't understand that has to do with the Torah, that has nothing to do with us. 
That's why they came to the Jews and say, you can learn your Torah. You can learn your Torah and do some of your rituals, but any ritual that is beyond our seichel, beyond our comprehension, don't do. Don't do a circumcision. We don't understand why. It's, it's a weird ritual. Don't do that. Don't do this, don't do that. So what did they want to do? They wanted to bring us to a, a, a lower level that we're constantly just operating through this Klippat Noga, meaning that I'm enjoying my life in this world. They have nothing to do with Luchnis. And that's why they wanted Lashkicham Toratecha, which is the worst in everything. It's worse than somebody like Mitzrayim, that Paro, he wanted to slave us. I want slaves. Or somebody 75 years ago, like Hitler, he wanted to kill us. He said, I'm in the open, I want to kill you. I don't want you in the world. The Greek, they were even more dangerous because they said, no, no, we don't mind that you live here. We just want to dis disconnect you from the Kadosh Bokho. And unfortunately, this is the exile that we are in today. That we see that the entire life is catering to us, our generation is catering to us, enjoy this world. And don't, don't think too much about Hashem. Don't focus on Hashem. I mean, you want to do some things, you want to eat kosher, fine, eat kosher. You want to pray, fine, pray. But don't do, don't go overboard. Klippat Noga is constantly trying to keep us numb. And this is this exile of Yavan, and this is what's the, the power that we were able to overcome in Kislev. Because everything that happens in the history constantly repeats itself. What we learn in history is not necessarily to, to celebrate something that happened, to commemorate something that happened 2,000 years ago. Rather, it's something that repeats itself. Like I said before, the Chagim, the Chag, it's coming around. It returns all the time. So the point from the month of Kislev is first of all to understand that the shine of the godly light in the month of Kislev is above the sending chain, is above Seder Shal Shalot. Meaning that it's the month of miracles. That's why even though Nisan is called by our sages the month of miracles, because that was the time of the, all the miracles in Egypt, but in the, in, in the Hasidic philosophy, the month of Kislev is also the month of miracles. It's also the month of the redemption. We celebrate, you know, we're going to celebrate soon, Yutet Kislev, and many other holidays that correspond to beyond nature miracle. And not only beyond, miracle, beyond nature miracle, a, 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 a miracle that has to do with, with, with some type of a redemption. So this is the month that has that power. Amazingly, like I said before, the words in Hebrew, they're not just invented. The word kislev, if you break it into half, it's chaf and samech, which comes from the word kisui, lekasot, to cover. And lev, lamed vav, is the 36 hours, the first 36 hours in creation, that the, the light of what's called the Oraganus was shining in the world before it was diminished. Now, if you look at the days of creation, it says, Vereshit bara lokim tashamayim vetaaretz. First Hashem created the world. And then he says, Vayar elohim kitov. And then it's talking about how he saw the light. And then he separated the light. And then he says that he diminished the light. Ah, she explains that this light, Hashem hid it. He concealed it to the time of the redemption. And it's going to be for the tzaddikim at the time of the geula, which we're going to see very soon. When Mashiach is going to come, he's going to take out this light from where it was concealed. This is called the Oraganuz. The light was, that was concealed for the tzaddikim latid lavo, for the world to come. Mazal Hashem, we're going to see it very soon. But it was shining for 36 hours. Then Hashem decided to separate it. And only on the fourth day, Hashem created the, the sun and the moon. I mean, a lot of people, they kind of get it wrong. They think that the light from the sun is the light that Hashem says, and they should be light. It has nothing to do with the sun. That's the light that the Kadosh Baruch decided to shine in the universe. But then when he saw how the world exists, he was like, okay, I'm going to take this light now and conceal it, and I will hide it to the days of Mashiach. So now I'll create a sun to shine into this world. And that was only happening on the fourth day. So the first 36 hours of creation... That's when the Oraganuz, this hidden light, was shining. So in Kislev, we have Kaf and Samech, it's Kisui, it's a cover. And Lamed Vav, which is the 36 hours that that light was shining. So we have the power in Kislev to remove the Kisui, to remove this concealment, and have this shine from the hidden light re be revealed. That's why you see that the holiday of Hanukkah is concent concentrating on light. On, on Pesach, we concentrate on Matzot. 
on Shavuot, we, we receive the Torah, we, we, we have the, whatever we do on Shavuot. Sukkot, we build the sukkah. Purim, we, get, we have a, a, a feast. Hanukkah is all about the light. It's called the holidays of light. In Hebrew, it's called Chagorot, the, the holiday of light. And what we are concentrating on is light. So this is the month that we have the power and the opportunity to actually remove the kisui, the cover, and reveal this unbelievable light. That's why it's called the, the month of, of miracles. And that's why you see, especially in the dynasty of Chabad, the revelation of Hasidut by the altar Rebbe, that was sat in jail for spreading Hasidut. And then happened the, 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 the great miracle on Yutet Kislev that he was released. Why? Because the light of the Hasidut, the, you know, the other side of holiness was not happy with what he's doing. You know, there's one opinion that says that the, 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 the prosecution in Shamaim was for the fact that he's spreading Hasidut. But really the prosecution in Shamaim was because he wasn't sharing it enough. Not because he wasn't doing it, because he wasn't shared enough. But we see before that in many things in history, and going all the way back 2,000, 2,500 years ago, for the time of Hanukkah. It was a miracle that was beyond Seder Ishtal Shalot. And how it became? Only because of Mesirot Nefesh, of the self-sacrifice of the Maccabim. Who, who, who's in their right mind will go out to find with the, fight with the whole army? They went beyond logic and they said, okay, this is a fight in Mesirot Nefesh. So if I want to analyze this entire thing, I want to know how is it affecting me? I mean, at the end of the day, when I learn Torah, I want to know how it's affecting me. What is it going to do with me? Okay, I understand very nice the history of our nation is beautiful. I understand everything you said. What is it going to do with me? Because I want to incorporate everything that I learn to be able to have it affect me and to inspire me and to, to make me a greater person and to take me to a different level. What I need to take from that, that this is the opportunity. Every month there's a certain power, a certain energy I can tap into. Now, I don't know if you were there on Friday, because I don't remember who was actually sitting, but I was explaining that on Pesach, for example, the fact that we, that we celebrate the holiday of Pesach, A, it says in the Torah that we have to celebrate it. B, we want to commemorate the, the freedom that we, we gained. But really, why are we celebrating the holiday of Pesach? Because on that specific day, a very special godly power came down to the world and it permeated the power for any Jew in all generations to be able to, be, to, to break free from their slavery, from their physical and spiritual slavery and to go into spiritual freedom. This is what happened on Pesach. That's why our sages, they say, Every generation a person has to seem like as if he left Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is not necessarily the country that is south of us. Rather, it's a state of mind that I'm in a state of limitation. That's why the older Rebbe says, Every day a person has to see himself like as if he went out of Mitzrayim, meaning that he went out of his boundaries, out of his limitation. And where do I get the power to do that? On the day of Pesach. So if I focus myself on that day, and I do exactly what the Torah tells me to do, not eating chametz, eating matzah, doing all that, we have a lot of mitzvot on Pesach. If I channel myself that day, 24 hours on what I'm supposed to do, I basically pull down to me this unbelievable power that I'm going to have the, 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 the power to always overcome my limitation. And I carry with it, I carry it with me for the rest of the year. The Rizal gives a promise that if a person will be extremely particular and fanatic about every little thing, seven days on Pesach, he's guaranteed he's not going to sin the entire year. This, of course accidental, I'm not talking about deliberately, I'm talking about whatever is accidental, but this is a pretty big promise, that if you are particular one week, and you're very particular about every little thing, you're guaranteed that the entire year you will not do any sin by accident, what's called Bishogeg. So this day is the day that I draw this power, that every day I'm struggling with what limits me, whether it's a, a, a fight to, with my Yetzirah, if I need to wake up in the morning or not, or to go and pray, or to do, go do this mitzvah, or to be particular with kosher, or particularly with how I talk, and not to lie, and not to cheat. Constantly we have these battles. This is a normal thing. I mean, we're not, nobody's different from each other. We're all 
fighting all day long our battles. This is what limits me. I want to be here right now. I don't want to battle these little things. I don't want to have this inclination every time I want to do a mitzvah. And these voices in my mind are telling me, forget about it. You don't have to do it. Don't worry. It's nonsense. I want to raise myself. So constantly I'm, biting, I'm, I'm fighting my limitations. The day that I draw the power to do that is Pesach. So every day of the year, especially holidays, it's a time when I can actually draw down a certain energy. This is an entire month that I can focus myself to receive this unbelievable power above descending chain to do everything that I do in Avodat Hashem and me serving God in what's called Mesirut Nefesh, in self-sacrifice. That everything is, when it comes to serving God, that's my highest priority. That's why at the end of the month, after the whole month, at the end of the month comes the holiday of miracles. There's another name for Hanukkah, the holiday of miracles. Al Anisim, that's what we say when we, when we pray, when we add, even we song. If the song that we sing, Al Anisim, on the miracles, it's a month of miracles. But if I want to bring down a miracle, then I have to, I have to do my motion, what is called Hitaruta Diltata, an awakening from below, if I do that motion, that I bring on myself this motion from above. So what I need to learn from that for the entire month of Kislev is that I have the ability to remove the concealment, reveal this unbelievable godly light that was concealed at the six days of creation. And if I act my part in the world in unbelievable self-sacrifice of Mesirut Nefesh in the little mitzvot that I do, I don't need to go now and fight an army. I need to fight my Yetzer HaRa b'msirut nefesh. And if I have a Yetzer HaRa for something as small as washing my hands after I go to the bathroom and saying a bracha, which a lot of people, they have a Yetzer HaRa with that. They forget that. Or if I have a Yetzer HaRa to bench, to say Birkat Amazon after I ate, and I keep pushing it, okay, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. Or a lot of people, you give them, you give them a roll. They ask you, is this Mizanot? Is this a Motzi? Just wash your hands. It's a Motzi. People try to be getting out of a mitzvah. So the Mesirut Nefesh is, that, is specifically on the little things. Not, nobody's asking us to go and fight armies now. Our Mesirut Nefesh is to fight the little mitzvot. And that's why the Galut, the exile of Yavan, corresponds to Choshech, to darkness. Because it's extremely hard to see this beautiful love that the Kadosh Baruch is shining on us. We're stuck in this exile. But this is the month that we can actually activate this miracle. And if each and every one of us concentrate on their own small domain, how I can go b'msirut nefesh out of my way, and my little act makes a huge difference. The Yetzirah is going to come and tell you, ah, washing now your hands is nonsense. It's, it's, it's a minor thing. Hashem doesn't even care about that. It's the complete opposite. Just by you focusing on, your, on five minutes on your, on your purity, and saying a blessing and thanking the Master of the Universe, that he create, how He created you, you can't even imagine what it affects in the in spiritual worlds and what you did to the entire world by you focusing for 30 seconds to say thank you Hashem, Asher Atzarat Adam Baruch that you created me in wisdom. So the point is that the Yetzirah is always going to draw this screen of darkness to tell them, ah, your mitzvahs are worthless. Your act is worthless right now. Ah, you don't have to be honest here. You don't have to pretend there. The point is to internalize how special is every little act that I do. And this is where the self-sacrifice comes in because we are not required to fight an army. We are required to fight a little thing. And this is where we, most people fail is in the little things. You're not going to go now and eat chas v'shalom pork. You're not going to go and drive on Shabbat. It's not going to even come up to your mind. But something small, ah, that I can, uh, that I don't have to do. But that's where... The treasure is hidden in these little things. And this is where one is required to have Mesirut Nefesh. And Baruch Hashem, I'm very happy that I'm not living 200 years ago. Their Mesirut Nefesh had to be to really, really die and be tortured to, 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 for the sake of the Kadosh Baruch We have it easy. We really have it easy. So our Mesirut Nefesh is, is, is finding the little things that are trying to push me away of the Kadosh Baruch And to remember constantly that this power that, that of the exile of Yavan is la'shkicham toratecha, to, to make me removed from the Torah. That's why our, our generation is flooded with movies and theater and art and internet and everything is so accessible. It's a rise. Just take, just take a lot of it. Who had it once? 
Who had this abundance 50, 60 years ago? Now you go on the street, you have here 20 restaurants. I can choose tonight is sushi, the next day is, is burgers, the next day is, is pizza. Who had such a luxury 50 years ago? 50 years ago you had a sandwich. Now the gallus, the exile, is offering you an abundance of nothing. So everything is very accessible, very easy, anything you want. You just click on the phone. All day long everybody's clicking on the phone. Like as if the entire world is hidden there. So the point is that we have to open our eyes and see what is creating this exile. It is this power of the exile of Greece that wanted us to be separated from the Torah and the Kadosh Baruch And when I monitor myself on that, and it has to have Mesir Nefesh, it has to have self-sacrifice, that's when I have the ability to remove this shield, this cover, and reveal this unbelievable light, this light that was shining for 36 hours when the world was created, and will shine very soon in the coming of Mashiach. So it's up to me to reveal it, and I have the power. And I'm saying I, I mean each and every one of you, not me necessarily, all of us. And each and every one of us has an unbelievable power in doing that. And the more we focus on that, we hasten the, the redemption to come much faster. And Bezad Hashem, we should light our candles this year in Bet HaMikdash instead of in a regular Chanukiah. And it's all depending on us. So Bezad Hashem, we should have a beautiful month. A month that you really inspire, get inspired, and you, you take the, the advantage of the month. A few months ago we had the month of Elul, it was the month of Tshuva. So we did Tshuva for, for 30 days. Now is the month of Mesirut Nefesh, of self-sacrifice on every little thing. And by me doing that, I elevate myself to, to levels that you can't even imagine that you can reach. Bezad Hashem, that is what's going to hasten the Gula. So Bezad Hashem, should see the Gula coming very soon. And it all, it's all in our hands. Any questions? You can't, that if it's instant pleasure, then it's coming from Toma. But what if it's like um, you're learning and it, you're getting like, into intellectually like satisfying. Okay. Is that like getting pleasure from that? If you if you enjoy what you learned for your own selfness, for your own ego, it will come through the side of impurity. And it will not remain. You're not gonna remember or you're not gonna benefit from that learning. That's why when you learn Torah it has to be for the sake of Shemaim. If I now learn something and now I'm all excited because I'm going to go and give a lecture and I'm going to sound so smart, then the Torah is now benefiting me. It's not for the sake of the Kadosh Boko. Meaning that I pull down this godly light through a filter, and that filter is dressed with impurity. So, right, the, so yeah. Why? Because I'm now taking the wisdom of the Torah, instead of learning for the sake of Shamayim of heavens, I'm learning to be smarter and sharper, and now I can answer, and now I can look real smart. Now, if I'm, de if I'm learning completely for the sake of heaven, and I'm deriving this unbelievable pleasure, and this is coming from the right place. It's a mitzvah. It's almost like enjoying this unbelievable meal on Shabbat. Yeah. It's, a it's a mitzvah. That yeah. That is already will last forever and ever. But if I'm taking anything from this world for my own sake, for my own ego, it's not going to last. And it can be in many different things that has to do with mitzvot. I can give now a lot of charity. But I'm doing it to have a, yeah, wow, he's such a, a generous guy and his name is all, all over the walls. I'm doing it only for my ego. I didn't get, I got like this, for the mitzvah out of it. You can't fool Shemaim. Hashem, Hashem knows why you did that. Now if you really gave the money because you really wanted to help that person you, and you got satisfaction, that's a whole different thing. But if I'm now donating hundreds of thousands of dollars so my name will be all over the walls, and I'm walking in the city like this, oh, I'm so generous. So I didn't do it for the sake of the mitzvah, I did it for the sake of my name and my ego. This is where it becomes a refined line. I mean, I was more talking about pleasures that I go on a vacation and go and uh, have these big meals and fancy meals, and I do it only for my own satisfaction. Right. But you brought up a very refined line, and also here. That's why serving Hashem honestly is not easy. Our ego always will kick in, and our ego also wants some type of satisfaction. One has to be very humble in front of the Kadosh Bukhu and say, No, I'm doing it for the sake of the Kadosh Bukhu. And you should have it in mind that you're doing it. Of course. But let's say you're not doing it for the sake and you're just saying it because you want to get so you have. So you have to be real with yourself, you have to be honest with yourself.
but is it better to say, oh, I'm doing it for the sake of Shemaim, even though you're not, but you want to get to that level? So say, I want to get to that level. The point is to always be humble and honest with yourself before you're honest, before in front of everyone. Yeah. First of all, Hashem knows exactly your intention. So you want to have in your mind, say, I want to get to this place. And you know how Moshe Rabbeinu became to the highest level ever? Because he was humble. He didn't say, I want to do it to myself. He just said, I'm doing everything for the sake of the Kadosh Baruch Hu. He was humble like the, like the, the land, the the. the and sand on the, on the ground and that's what made him such a great leader that's why we refer to him as Moshe Rabbeinu our teacher every, every leader got a title Avraham got Avraham Avinu our father Yosef, Yosef HaTzadik David HaMelech Shaul or, 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 or Aaron HaKohen here Moshe got Rabbeinu our teacher why? because this is what Hashem wants us to, to know to be humble be humble I'll make you great if you're supposed to be great, you'll be great because Hashem wants you to be great. If I don't want you to be great, I'm going to keep you not great. And Moshe Rabbeinu is the ultimate example of being humble. And you see that the Kadosh Buhu raised him up to a level that nobody will ever or ever did come up to this level. Of Moshe Rabbeinu. So he got the title Rabbeinu, our teacher. So I, when I want to grow up in my spiritual level, I can have some Hasidic ego and say, yeah, I want to grow. Okay, humble yourself, Hashem will, Hashem will already rise you up. And you have to be honest with yourself and with the Kadosh Baruch And you want to do everything L'Shem Shemaim, for the sake of heaven. I'm eating now, for the heaven's sake. I'm going to sleep, so I can wake up in the morning and serve the Kadosh Baruch And the more you work on yourself, you get to a point that you do everything by default. It's for Hashem. I'm doing everything for Hashem, I don't need any gratification. That's when you really get the real pleasure, spiritual pleasure, and the gratification for eternity. Because Hashem says you did it for, not for, for you to have anything, now you're going to get the most. And we see the example in our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. They were, in, in the, our terminology, they were billionaires. They had everything that they wanted. Why? Because their entire life was devoted only to the Kadosh Baruch Avraham Avinu didn't care about anything, just serving the master of the universe. Therefore he became richer and richer and richer. They're all multi-multi-millionaires. Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov were like Bill Gates in our generation. They had more money than you can imagine. Because they didn't care about the money. It was not, it was not about power or fame. Avraham Avinu was always, you see that what we read now in the previous parashot, he always, he had a fight with Lot. You go here, take everything. We don't want, I don't want to fight. So we have to learn from them. That's why they're our forefathers, to learn their behavior. And they were 100% devoted and, and, and old to the Kadosh Bucho. They were what's called Maaseh Merkava, a chariot, because they had nothing for themselves, just the Kadosh Baruch And if we will have 1% of that, we'll be doing good. Thank you very much. <laughs>